Uh, our next speaker is uh, no stranger to any of you, I would imagine, uh, Mr. Darren Grimes, Brexit hero, uh, social media star. But uh, I'll always think of him uh, not necessarily with the BBC, but as the man who took on the establishment and won. Uh, I've just come from the media room inside the secure zone and uh, there's a few sort of swift, uh, switchy looking BBC people who are, what the hell is he doing in here? <laughs> and there's over, there's some sort of like water coolers and some coffee tankers. I walked over and I thought, oh well, I'm knackered from last night, I'm going to have a coffee. And there's this mean sign on the wall that says BBC only, scribbled in pen. And I thought, well, licence fee, I'll be having that. <laughs> and needless to say, I enjoyed my coffee at the BBC's expense. But I think... No, my expense. Well, your expense. Yeah, that's right, David. <laughs> I think the, this, this campaign, Defund the BBC, has to be the fastest growing, most successful campaign that I've been a part of. A very minor part, <laughs> uh, which you have been doing stellar work, and I think everyone here recognises that. The social media output and engagement is just astonishing. It's such a fast pace, and I think there's a reason for that. Right, highlighting everything from the, the BBC Rich List, right, where you've got Gary Lineker, of course, luxuriating in his millions, <laughs> to pontificate on politics. Stick to the footy, Gaza. And Zoe Ball, I think that's a really good example where Zoe received 1.36 million from the licence fee payer and lost a million viewers. <laughs> she, get, she was given a pay rise to over a million quid for losing a million viewers. In what other job, in what other industry would you be expected to lose a million viewers, which must be a hell of a lot of money if you were to put it on a commercial basis, and then receive a pay increase of that size. And, well, it comes to... Ex <laughs> no, you're absolutely right, though. It was politics, it was political, because apparently it was done to fiddle the BBC's gender pay gap statistics. And you look at all of this and you think, my God, what on earth is going on here? So you've done sterling work in exposing everything from that... Do you remember that monologue from Emily Maitlis? <laughs> on BBC Newsnight, on Dominic Cummins, where she told us what we should think about Mr Cummins. I think we've all got a view on Mr Cummins already, thank you very much, <laughs> especially David Davis. And <laughs> there have been podcasts on white women calling them privileged Karens that the BBC then... They didn't remove the podcast, but they did remove the clip yeah. on social media, and I think that's because of you applying pressure to them on that. There, you saved rule Britannia yes. from the proms. <laughs> Let's not forget Sterling Work, where the BBC said we couldn't sing some of our most patriotic national anthems. And you just sort of think, you mean-spirited... I won't say the word. <laughs> and there have been Dawn French's Vicar of Dibley taking the knee to Black Lives Matter. You mentioned there the sort of wanton acts of criminality mm. that the under that banner, the Black Lives Matter banner, took place last summer. Despite that, as you said, and I don't think you can... It wasn't in quotation marks. No. Largely peaceful. <laughs> yeah, and everyone could see. Largely right peaceful. I mean, what... Uh, that is not my idea of a largely peaceful protest, to tell that, you that, that much for free. That was the day after that um, uh, policewoman had got knocked off. Exactly, yeah, and ended up in hospital. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... The outfit responsible, as I say, for that, those wanton acts of criminality uh, was dismissed as being largely peaceful in a sort of CNN. And we, I think we hold CNN in America as an idea of what a sort of biased news organisation can look like. And I'm sorry, but the BBC, which is supposed to be unbiased because we all are forced to pay it with the threat of prison, as you've just set out, the BBC was sort of mirroring the reporting on Black Lives Matter that CNN were doing as well. So you sort of get into territory of thinking, what the hell are we actually paying for here? And it tends to be, I think, the views of, as you said, a small metropolitan elite that tend to preside in university cities and London. And uh, you sort of, you get into territory where you end up with a display that we saw on New Year's Eve, where you had the Black Lives Matter fist, that symbol of communist tyranny throughout the world displayed in the sky via drones and the BBC doing a nice job of helping Mr Mayor Khan 
display this to the nation. Now, you might have been sat there last year and thinking, do you know what, this year has been bloody horrible. Perhaps my national broadcaster can cheer me up. The colours of the EU broadcast into your room and the colours of the, that Black Lives Matter and the fist. And you sort of think, why are they doing Mayor Khan's work? And it's because they quite like Mayor Khan. They quite like his view of the world. And that culminated in polls that showed that only 33% believe that the BBC represents their standpoint. And you sort of get into the territory there of saying, well, they've forgotten the British part of their name, I'm afraid. But it's hardly surprising. I think despite Brexit was probably the, the most favoured go-to for their lexicon last year, uh, well, since 2016, actually. And you don't get me started on the BBC's comedy, right? No one to the right, uh, sort of left of Chairman Mao, I think, has been allowed to, to sort of do a, a sketch on the BBC since what, Little Britain? That's been cancelled. That's, that's every ism and phobia under the sun now. And um, I think BBC content these days, ultimately, and actually it's new hires, they have to meet what I describe as being the three Bs. Anti-Boris, anti-Brexit, anti-Britain. Mm. And I'm afraid to say that their new hire, for their head of BBC Brammer. News, yeah, and all the rest of it, yes, yes uh, Brammer. Brammer, exposing, you did sterling work exposing the sort of, the fact that well, actually, there was June Sarpong as well. Remember that one? £75,000 for three days a week. <laughs> for three days a week as the BBC's diversity chief. Yeah. Um, that one, I think, is extraordinary because I would have advised the BBC on diversity for free. <laughs> and I would have sat them down. I thought you were. No, well, there we are. And I would have said, listen, listen, Tim, me and you is going to have words. Your diversity problem is quite simple, right? It can be summed up. It's nothing to do with skin colour, gender identity, sexuality, some rainbow coalition. I could go through a whole list of things. It's nothing to do with any of that. The BBC's diversity problem is quite simple. It's the lack of diversity of thought, right? And it's the idea that, and I remember tweeting this, and it got a lot of interaction, and I'm afraid to say it's not because people were supportive of the idea, <laughs> but I had said, if the BBC wouldn't feel comfortable making Darren Grimes head of News UK, <laughs> then it shouldn't be comfortable about making someone like Brammer head, Jess Brammer, isn't it, head of BBC News UK, because she has expressed views that are hyper-partisan in the past. She has clearly shown that she is not someone that can be non-partisan, and despite that, she was <coughs> given that plum job, that nice little role heading up BBC News, which people still watch, which people still rely on, right? So, as I say, she ticked the three Bs and she was, get, she was, that's it, you're in. Now, that for me is deeply troubling. And she clearly found her feet because not long after she was given the role, there was that uh, BBC News item that you mentioned there on how climate change scientists how they're coping with their anxiety. <laughs> and you just think people have got real problems in the minute. I mean, this party doesn't seem to know its arse from its elbow. And you're focusing on the anxiety of climate change scientists. <laughs> really? Are you serious? Are you having a laugh? So all of these things, I think, suggest that the licence fee, being forced to pay it, and my mother was one of those mothers that had the BBC knock at the door, absolutely terrified. She went through a pretty nasty divorce uh, when I was at school. And uh, we stopped paying the licence fee. She unplugged the telly and said, we're not going to watch that anymore. The BBC came round to the door. You haven't, been pay you haven't paid up. Pay up, missus. And she says, well, don't watch it. And I just thought, I remember thinking, I was a kid at the time, but I remember thinking how mean mm. and just the idea that you go around knocking at single mother's doors mm. that are struggling mm. and say, well, hang on a minute, love. Yeah. Gary Lineker needs his, uh, yeah. needs his salary. <laughs> Cough up, pet. Mm. The idea that you could do that to fund an antiquated, regressive form of taxation. And I'm, I'm afraid, David, you know, you have been one of my heroes as far as standing up against the state, the state, the state and taxation and all these other things. I don't, I think it's indefensible in 2021. I really do. For all the reasons
reasons that you've listed, the fact that there is this vibrant broadcasting landscape that you can access at the touch of a button, and guess what? You can cancel it whenever you like, and the BBC don't go around, or the, the, you know, Amazon doesn't go around knocking at your door asking why you haven't coughed up for Jeremy Clarkson's salary so he can do his farming programme, which is very good, by the way. Um, <laughs> But I think it goes back to that fundamental point for me. It goes back to the fact that, and I don't often make social justice arguments, I tell you that much, but there is a real social justice argument, and it's one that I think the left shamefully doesn't represent or champion enough, which is the fact that this really is a regressive and antiquated tax, where you pay it no matter how much you make, you all pay the same, it's a flat tax, you all pay it, and that's despite, you know, they don't take into account income or all the rest of it. And now pensioners are having to pay it as well. Pensioners are paying it, <coughs> despite the fact that that broadcaster does not broadcast their views or opinions anymore and hasn't done for quite some time, not in my lifetime. The 28 years I've been on this planet, I don't think the BBC has represented the views of my grandmother, that's fair to say. So I think you've done absolutely sterling work and I can't thank you enough, I'm sure we all agree on that. Uh, and I really, really do think it's time for parliamentarians, Nadine, <laughs> Miss Dorries, to get the BBC sorted yeah. and actually drag it, mm. kicking and screaming if she has to, and I'm sure she will, into the 21st century. I really, really do. So thank you very much for listening to me, Warble On, for the <laughs> past however many minutes it's been.